Uh, Boker Tov, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I must say that my work in uh, my work actually does not involve uh, golemic uh, exposure, and so this is for me a rather novel and uh, unique experience. I suspect that I will learn as much, if not more, than you from our distinguished panel of uh, speakers. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank, though, uh, John Loike for inviting me to come here. He, John knows how much I love Israel, and so any opportunity I have to come here, I, I jump at, and I appreciate it very much, and it's been a wonderful conference thus far. Let me just say a very quick word before uh, introducing our first speaker. Uh, the issue of a, uh, a golem, uh, and uh, it really gets to, uh, it, it talks about basically humans trying to create life or some form of life. And uh, our uh, Professor Edel will go into this in greater detail. But uh, clearly the reason this was put on the program, uh, the, our conference motto is the uh, detection and creation, the challenges, have the power to detect and create. Yesterday basically we discussed the power to detect and the, and the ethical issues involved therein. Today we are talking about the power to create. And in fact, uh, science, and I will mention to you a few things that I heard yesterday at a luncheon talk by Dr. Um, uh, Loike. Uh, in fact, uh, stem cells have been taken from human beings and implanted in animals with the purpose of having the creation of organs that will be compatible with human beings so that these organs can be transplanted in humans. Already we see some form of unique life, type, life creation which did not exist uh, as a result of evolution. In addition, there is the identification of a gene called the FOX20 gene, 22 gene, which is a very unique gene in humans that gives us the power of speech and scientists have implanted the Fox gene into mice. Now, although there has not yet been a case report of a talking mouse, there have been morphologic changes in the brains of mice in areas where speech uh, in humans does in fact emanate from. Uh, one can only consider what would happen if some condition of humanity. And I'll finish by saying, and I was speaking with uh, Professor Edel just before this conference, Finally, I did see a link between what I do and the golemic issue. In, I deal a lot with end-of-life issues. I deal a lot with when can we remove life support, when is it ethical to remove uh, 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 organs. What is the definition of death? And the definition of death is something that is not clear-cut at all, and it does come back to the issue of what constitutes humanity. When do we stop being a human being? When is that humanness gone, and there is a great deal of debate. Some people holding, for example, that somebody in a persistent vegetative state, with their heart beating and they are breathing, having lost cortical function, they, are no, they have lost their humanity, their humaneness, and therefore vital organs can be taken from such people for transplantation. That is not being done, but people are advocating. So you see that this whole issue of what constitutes humanity, what constitutes life, is a very critical issue both at the beginning and the creativity issue and at the end of life as well. And so without further ado, I can I would like to introduce our first speaker, who will be Professor Ron Goldstein, the Mina Everard Goodman Faculty of Life Sciences here at Bar Ilan. Professor Goldstein. Um, I'd like to thank uh, John Loki for inviting me to participated in the second round of a was really exciting conference last time, five years ago, and again this time. Um, and for my presentation, uh, I don't have slides. I, we can all pretend that this is Tikkun uh, El Shavuot, or it's Shabbat afternoon, or something like that. And we'll have to just imagine. Um, and actually, maybe it's better that I don't have slides, because what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, a mythological creature called the Chimera. Um, in Greek mythology, a mixture of a human being and other kinds of creatures. And uh, I myself have been involved in uh, making chimeras, and maybe I'll even tell you a little story about it. I took sabbatical about 10 years ago, and I was approached by uh, one of the world's leading uh, scientists who study human embryonic stem cells, Nixon Ben Venissi at Hebrew University, and he said, let's put 
human pluripotent stem cells, and yesterday we learned that pluripotent beings that it can make everything, pluripotent stem cells into a chick embryo, because I used to work on chick embryos, I still do a little bit, and let's see whether they'll develop there. And this was, uh, to me, sounded like fun, but then we tried to get uh, ethical permissions to do this experiment, and uh, lo and behold, Hebrew University refused to give permission to do this experiment. Unfortunately, Bar Ilan, the ethics committee, did give me permission, and uh, what I hoped would be my sabbatical spent near my home in Jerusalem working at the Hebrew University, I ended up having to come back and commuting to Bar Ilan to do the experiments, because it wasn't allowed there, it was allowed here. And what we did was we took human embryonic stem cells, as I mentioned before, and as uh, Dr. Schoen yesterday mentioned, they can make every part of the body. Um, the reason they're pluripotent and not totipotent is because they, in theory, don't make the, uh, the placenta as well, but human embryonic stem cells can under certain conditions, but we won't go into that. In any case, we implanted these into uh, chicken embryos and found that the cells survived, they differentiated, means they turned into cells that now did real things like they turned into nerve cells, cartilage cells, maybe kidney cells, and uh, when the paper was uh, published, it made quite a splash. It was reviewed in Nature, and there was uh, jokes on Israeli television about nishtahin, nishtaher, nishtahum, the chicken. So uh, this is something, of course, that it has a gut reaction that people don't like. The National Institutes of Health in the United States of America absolutely forbid this experiment. Uh, I sign uh, forms, I just signed them again now, uh, since I have cells cell lines of human embryonic stem cells that were generated by Professor Itzkowitz uh, when he was at, in Wisconsin. Um, I sign every year that I will not put those cells into embryos, but in order to do the experiments that I did, I got the cells from uh, another institution which was not funded by the federal government. In any case, what's the idea about making chimeras? Um, there are a number of different reasons to make chimeras. Uh, the major reason that we as scientists make chimeras with pluripotent stem cells is to test the potency and the reality, if you wish, of the cells that we make from embryonic stem cells. So the most, the classic uh, example is one of the big goals of human embryonic stem cell research is to make uh, cells, brain cells that secrete dopamine to replace those that are lost in Parkinson's disease. This has been a dream ever since the, uh, maybe even since the mouse embryonic stem cells were, were derived 25 years ago, 28 years ago. And if you want to know whether these cells in a dish, you know, they make action potentials, they, acti they activate like you would expect uh, nerve cells, and if you depolarize them, if you give them a little bit of a stimulus, they secrete dopamine in the dish. But if you want to know they actually alleviate a disease and they can do something, then you have to put them into the brain of an animal and see whether it alleviates Parkinson's-like symptoms. And so you can take a mouse or a rat and deliver a drug, um, actually a drug that's used uh, by children who are not very smart because it gives them Parkinson's-like sy uh, symptoms and it can damage, you can intentionally damage part of the brain with these part, the, uh, the dopamine neurons, and you implant instead human embryonic stem cells that have been bathed in a special soup which makes them into the right kind of neurons that should cure Parkinson's. You put them into the rat's brain, and lo and behold, the rat who used to have the wrong kind of movement behavior actually would go around in circles because we damaged his motors. Uh, the motor section on one side of the brain, now starts to walk correctly. So this is a very, I would say, ethically uh, trivial kind of experiment. Nobody today has any kind of question about taking, would, if we would make pancreas cells and put them in a, uh, a mouse that has diabetes to see if this would cure the diabetes. Nobody has any kinds of problems with this. The problem is, is when you go uh, earlier in development, uh, like we did with the chick, and as a group did at the Rockefeller University, implanting human embryonic stem cells into mouse embryos, which uh, which was a real is a real no-no according to a lot of people, um, because then you have the potential, uh, as was mentioned just now, about this gene, the the fox fox t fox two p gene, which can uh, bring speech. Um, that's, of course, you have lots of problems with getting speech. Our tongue is very, very special, and our 
the, the cranial nerves that involve in, in uh, innervating the tongue and all these kinds of things, it would be very difficult, I think, to confer in a, in a non-primate to, to, to able to get speech. But the question is, and there was actually a paper in Science about this a few years ago, is if you make a chimera, how much of the brain of this animal that you're putting these human cells into would you be allowed to be human? In other words, if we were to make a mouse that would have 60 or 70 or 80 percent of its brain made up of human cells, would this animal now have any kind of, could it develop consciousness? Could it have any kind of human status? Um, and here I guess it comes close to the golem. I was going to say the only thing that I know about golem is, um, like yesterday I had to run out of a conference because I had a seminar course and the students basically sat in the room like golems, but that's all about, I can tell you about the golem. Um, would you end up with a creature that would have all the physical characteristics, external characteristics of an animal, but perhaps if its nervous system, if its brain rather, was composed primarily of human neurons, would you have something uh, of a different kind of status? And this is being discussed, um, and primarily, if I remember the conclusions in the paper in Science, well, that uh, in primates one would worry more about this than would worry about it in lower animals. Um, but it's something that could be done, and uh, ethicists and uh, biologists are, are thinking about it. Um, the other kind of chimera, besides transplanting cells and organs and tissues from, uh, from derived from stem cells into animals, is genetic chimerism. And there, there's some interesting possibilities. Um, in, in mice, there's a huge amount of, of advanced biological research and our understanding of genes in people is done today by, made, by making transgenic mice, by changing the genetic composition of mice, and we heard some descriptions actually in several of the talks here today. Um, in theory, this could be done with people too. Um, we have the same, many transgenic mice are made by taking embryonic stem cells, not human, but mouse embryonic stem cells, switching their genes by a process called homologous recombination, where you switch, and you don't take a risk of putting the gene in the wrong place of the genome, it goes in the right place. You switch exactly for that gene, and you could, for example, conceive of a case where you would take an embryo or embryonic stem cells that have sickle cell anemia and switch out the gene for sickle cell anemia and put in a normal gene and then put this into an embryo and through the same kinds of technolo technology that one uses for making transgenic mice, one could make a transgenic human and cure genetic diseases and not have to select embryos through PGD, et cetera. So this is also a, a kind of chimerism that uh, at the moment is not allowed anywhere in the world, I think uh, in Israel either, the idea of making, uh, making human beings, making stem cells in this way, and in, for research purposes has been bandied about, but is also at the moment, I don't know how many ethical committees would allow the creation of an embryo in order to destroy it. There's so many surplus embryos from IVF that this is not something that seems to come up. Uh, the other kind of chimera that it actually uh, we do hear about and uh, I spoke about it at the last conference, and since then there's been a lot of movement in England about it, is that for, for pluripotent uh, stem cell research, it's useful to have uh, human eggs. Um, and there aren't a lot of egg donors, and the Knesset just passed yesterday a law having to do with egg donors as well. And one of the things that's explicitly mentioned in the law is for research purposes. But it's still not a lot, and it's dangerous for women to, to donate eggs. So the idea has been around for a long time, since the egg gives only 1% of the DNA, and that's in the mitochondria. Why not use non-human eggs for um, creating embryonic stem cells? Not for making people, obviously, but at least for making embryonic stem cells for research purposes. And the idea would be to do the kind of dolly experiment, except use the sheep egg and use human genetic material, and then you'd end up with a human animal chimera. This, uh, the legal basis for doing this has been passed in England, and there's a paper that came out of China five, six years ago where they claimed actually to, to have made human embryonic stem cells in this way with rabbit eggs. So that's basically three different kinds of these chimera, um, not so mythological, actually practical, that we're doing in the lab today, and I guess they'll have implications in terms of making creatures that are 
uh, whose humanity is questionable at one level or, or another. The three times, again, the three types of chimeras, again, are transplanting of tissues, transplanting of genes, and use of animal eggs for uh, containers for human genetic material. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Goldstein. Um, we will have time at the end for questions. We're going to have each of our presenters present, and then at the end, uh, it'll be open to you for questions. I'd now like to introduce um, Israel Belfer, Israel Belfer, who is a PhD student in science, technology, and society program here at Bar Ilan University. Machon Hagavot Torah. Please, Israel. Thank you. 